Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to ACCP's CSR Marketplace virtual program, and specifically for this afternoon's session on employee volunteerism and engagement, hosted by Story Pirates. My name is Jean Metzger. I'm ACCP's Vice President of Membership Marketing and Communications, and I'm so glad you're able to join us today. For those of you who may be new to ACCP, the Association of Corporate Citizenship Professionals is the premier membership association working to improve the effectiveness of corporate social impact professionals. We connect our members to the people, knowledge, and resources they need to enhance the impact they're having in their companies and in their communities. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this is just one session of several that will be hosted this week. On the slide that's appearing on the screen is our CSR Marketplace virtual schedule, and you can still register for the remaining programs. They are all being recorded, and we will be making recordings available to everyone who registers and on our website. ACCP is committed to providing high quality programming that shares practical and actionable insights. In addition to this week's CSR Marketplace, we have several programs coming up, including our monthly webinars and our Impact Measurement Summit in early December. Registration is open for all these programs on our website. We also have confirmed dates for our 2025 forum, CSR Intensive, which will take place in April in Chicago, and our 2025 annual conference, which will be in Atlanta next September. For those who may be interested in learning more about ACCP membership, you can visit our membership page for details on benefits and pricing. And for those of you who are already members, we encourage you to share information about ACCP to your professional network, as member referrals are our number one source of new members. You will find sample language and tools on our Member Get a Member webpage. Now for some webcast housekeeping. We have enabled transcripts and closed captioning for this webcast. You can click on live transcripts to view subtitles. And if you click on the caret on live transcript and select view full transcript, you'll find the full transcript of the webcast. Chat is enabled for you to engage with other attendees and the panelists throughout the webcast or the program, and I encourage you to do so. We also will take Q&A um, towards the end of the discussion. And we encourage you throughout the program to use the Q&A feature to ask the panelists questions. And if you see a question that resonates with you, please click the thumbs up button by the question to upvote it. And with that, I'd like to turn over our presentation to Amy Fury. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jean and ACCP. Uh, we are so glad to be here today. Uh, my name is Amy Fiore. I am a managing director of Sobel Bixel Consulting for Nonprofits. And our session today is called Finding the Perfect Fit Between a Corporation and a Nonprofit in Terms of Volunteer Programming, um, to be honest, is more about making the perfect fit. Uh, we are going to explore through a panel discussion, a moderator list panel discussion, um, really a case study between the relationship between myself, a uh, professional fundraiser, um, a corporation represented by Alyssa May, who is formerly of uh, Salesforce, and a nonprofit organization represented by Jamie Salka, CEO and founder of Story Pirates and Story Pirates Changemakers. Um, and we're going to talk about our relationship from inception to today today um, from each of our perspectives. Um, what we're going to cover is harmonizing nonprofit and corporate needs. We're going to talk about finding ways to meaningful conversations between those entities. And we're going to talk about unpacking our assumptions that hinder effective partnerships. So Let's start with some uh, quick introductions to focus on what led us to connect to one another. So Jamie, superhero that you are, could you start with your origin story, please? Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Great to be here with you. I am the co-founder and CEO of the Story Pirates. Our origin story is that we started out in 2004 in the 60-seat basement of the Drama Bookshop in Midtown Manhattan. 
we were a collection of college friends, uh, mostly comedians, who put on a sketch comedy show in which every sketch that we performed was inspired by a story given to us by a kid, an elementary school kid. It was a super fun show, and it also had the effect of making kids feel seen and heard for their own written work. So it turned into a creative writing program. That first uh, season of Story Parts was co-produced by myself and a totally unknown at the time, Lin-Manuel Miranda and Tommy Kale. They were writing In the Heights on the little piano that we did Story Parts on. And we grew up as an arts education organization. We were in 12 schools that first year teaching creative writing programs and adapting students' stories into sketch comedy in their auditoriums. The next year we were in 75 schools and a few years later we were in thousands of schools. We eventually sort of grew up as a media company as well. We started doing bigger national tours in large theaters around the country. We did the Kennedy Center for both of President Obama's inaugurations. And in 2017, we launched a podcast based on the exact same sketch comedy show we did so many years earlier in that little basement theater. Uh, taking stories submitted to us by kid listeners and adapting them on our show. And the podcast just became the number one podcast for kids and families almost overnight. It stayed there. We've won almost every award in podcasting, often three times over, and we just crossed the 100 million download mark. And I should mention, because it's relevant to this panel, we get about 30 to 40,000 stories each year sent to us by kids all over the world now. And it's really important to us to let all the kids know who sent us stories that even though we can only adapt probably 50 stories or so on our podcast each season, that it's not a writing contest. We do not, uh, we're not picking winners. They're all winners to us. And the way that we let kids know that we love their writing is a, an initiative that we started called Story Love. And it is a an initiative in which we read and write personal, thoughtful um, responses to every single kid who sent us their story, uh, making sure that we call out details that we really appreciated and encouraging them to keep writing. And it's an enormous amount of work and the way that we've gotten that work done is by turning it into a corporate volunteer program. So we partner with Fortune 100 companies uh, and you know, we, we give these stories to volunteers around the country uh, at major corporations to help read and write thoughtful responses to all these kids. Alyssa, how did we find you? <laughs> Thanks. I always loved hearing that story, Jamie, especially um, Lee Manuel Miranda. You've got some famous roots. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. It's lovely to be part of um, this ACCP virtual uh, session. And my work, and just to tell you a little bit more about me, I've been in the social and environmental impact space my entire career starting in the nonprofit world, and I moved into the corporate space. Um, and most recently, I was at Salesforce doing this work globally and building partnerships um, that span the globe. And we're here to talk about one of those today um, with Story Pirates and Story Love. Um, I have a consulting practice as well that I do off the side of my desk. I've been doing that for about eight years where I support early stage companies to build social impact and environmental social and governance strategy at the ground floor of their companies that can help them to grow in scale as the company grows in scales. Um, and that's the fun work that I get to do. And where did we meet um, Story Pirates and Amy and Jamie? Um, we're going to do a little rewind, not that we want to, and that it's a fun time to think about, but let's go back to the early days of the pandemic. And um, I was managing our global volunteer programs at Salesforce, 
And like many people at that time, we were just thrust into this virtual world and we were trying to figure out what we what what to do really and how to engage employees during this very uncertain and scary time and how to keep them engaged with the company and the company was doing a variety of efforts around that um and one of those was kind of searching out partners in the nonprofit space that could help us to do that and to have something really impactful but also that aligned with our strategic priority areas, which were at that time education and workforce development. And a member of my team came to me and said, hey, we've been doing these story love sessions over here in New York. They're really fun. Seems like they could be virtual. Um, do you want to set up a call with them? And I thought, sure. I mean, what, what do we have to lose at this point? Like, we don't have any partners that can help us with this right now. Um, so... I remember hopping on that first call. I remember it very clearly with Amy um, and Jamie and kind of outline, just kind of spewing out like all the things we needed. Like we needed this to be global. We needed this to all of the needs that we had. And we'll just kind of talk through maybe, you know, the development of this partnership and, you know, how that might look a little bit differently or how I might've done things differently. I said, we have some money to put it through at this. Like, can you, can you do it? And I, all I remember was they were like, yeah, yeah, we got this. They were very agreeable and very excited um, around the partnership. So to me, it sounded like, yeah, they've got this. So that's, that's where it began. Amy? It is where it began. Um, so my background, is, uh, as I mentioned, is as a, uh, I, I'm a career um, nonprofit administrator. Uh, I started with Story Pirates about six years ago um, and inherited a, a, as the director of development, in addition to my nonprofit consulting, um, and I inherited uh, a corporate volunteer program that was um, already brilliant. Um, um, the difference at the time was all of the stories that we received were printed. Uh, they were handwritten. They uh, in in children's hands. They were you know colored in with crayons, and we would put them into suitcases, into rolly suitcases with golf pencils and little pieces of paper in a very complicated system of Manila folders that would make sure that the right story got the right story you love note that went back into the right folder that got back onto the right shelf in our office office that then made it back uh, to that particular teacher or to that particular family. Um, and there were, we had some corporate partners at that point. We were rolling those suitcases into boardrooms. And when um, the, the pandemic started mid-March 2020, um, we were, you know, we were in, we were in a lot of trouble to be honest with you. We were an organization, other than these boardrooms, we were an organization that existed on live stages. It existed in classrooms. Um, and, you know, the, that's actually where the, the money was coming in from. And, you know, as a part of senior leadership, I was, I was privy to a bit of that panic and um, more than a bit. And I, um, when I got a phone call, I got a couple, I think there was about two phone calls that we got pretty early on, not even April, 2020 saying, Hey, that, uh, that like writing note on kids stories, things that, that thing that you guys do, you, can you do it virtually? Um, and knowing we were panicking, um, I said, yes, the, the truth was, could we do it virtually? I don't know. I had no idea if we could do it. I, I, I knew that we couldn't in the moment that I was saying it. I had uh, uh, a younger colleague who, <laughs> who knew that this was going to fall on his head, um, frantically texting me to say, no, we can't. And I didn't want to scare him. I recognized that there was an opportunity. Um, I recognized there was zero space for me to say no. And I'll be honest with you. I was scared. We were all scared at that point. I think we all sort of can remember that that this sort of feeling of of being terrified. And for better or worse, in that moment, I just said yes. Um, and 
we then scrambled. We scrambled in ways that are that are sort of absurd to think about now. I remember the discussion of, um, are we putting interns in like hazmat suits on the subway to get to the office to get the the stories so that we can scan them? You know, there was you know one one employee who lived close enough that they were able to walk to get the stories and then mail them to interns. And we're now on Amazon shipping scanners to to our interns' parents' houses um, in order to build this system that we initially built on, you know, on Google Drive, regardless of whether we didn't even think about whether or not every corporation could actually access Google Drive. But we basically, we built this, we built this program because we had to. Um, and never once in that moment, never did I think when someone like Alyssa said to me, hey, can you do this thing digitally? Did I think to say, maybe, yes, with some help. Um, there was coming from the development world, coming from the fundraising nonprofit world where we beg, steal and borrow, right? Like we are scrappy, we make it happen on our own. And the 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 what we know is when a funder asks you to do something, you do it most of the time. Um, there was no space in my mind to say, maybe. So I said yes, and we managed to um, we managed to make it work, and that really was the beginning of of where we started. Because I made an assumption that if I said anything other than yes, the corporation, Alyssa, um, would walk away and would say, oh, well, we'll find somebody else because we didn't know who else was making this happen. We knew it was early. We knew uh, we knew we were desperate at that time. And so my assumption was, if I said any version of anything other than the word yes in that moment, then I I would be in trouble, that we would be in trouble as an organization. And luckily, um, Jamie's response when I said, hey, I, saw, I just enlisted us in something was was basically like, Heck yeah, you did. What else were you going to say? There was no other answer within that moment because of because of the world and the assumptions that that we had from our non nonprofit space. So, um, Alyssa, let's let's turn then back to you. Um, what were your assumptions in in that in that moment? Yeah, I think. I mean, it, it's. Whenever we have this conversation, I just, I think of the head spaces that we were all in in that moment. And if I could have just like pulled myself up a little bit and, you know, ask some additional questions or, um, you know, just handle things a little bit differently. But the assumptions that I made were really around, and we're going to talk through kind of how the partnership developed. We're going to get there, but this is just us kind of building up and sharing assumptions. And this is just the stuff that comes up when you're building these relationships and kind of the power dynamic that exists in the in the corporate and nonprofit space. I assumed when you said, yeah, we can do that. I assumed, okay, they've got a turnkey process, a virtual turnkey process in place that they're able to activate and they can activate it not just in New York, but globally, because it's virtual. Um, it's been tried, it's been tested. Um, they can staff in all the time zones that we exist in. And if you're on the call and you're at a company that has global presence, you know, you have to be thinking about that. You know, can we do this in India? Can we do this in Dublin? Can we do this in Australia? Like, you know, so, you know, we started listing off all these locations. They're like, yep, yep, yep. Like we can, we can do it. Um, and kind of assuming, oh, they must have staff in those places that, you know, that are going to be doing this. And I think, you know, you'll hear from Jamie a little bit around what that meant. Um, and those are kind of the assumptions that I was making. There's just like a ready supply of stories that are virtually available that the employees are going to be able to love on. And, you know, large groups of people can do this. And yeah, that it was and kind of tried and tested. I think um, I picked up a little bit on the fact that maybe it wasn't tried and tested. And so when we did have the discussion, I remember saying, and this I think happens a lot when you're entering into new partnerships with nonprofits, especially in the volunteer space. Like, let's try one. Let's pilot it. Let's see how this goes. Let's do a couple. And um, I think behind that, for me, there were some fears that I want to share. Like, I think 
on the corporate side, um, depending upon what company you sit at, there's a perception that, you know, these things that you put on globally for employees need to be very buttoned up and very high caliber, and they need to have a certain level of quality to them before you put them out into the world. So those pilots were going to be really integral to making sure, in my mind, that we had that level of um, had done that level of due diligence, but also that, you know, we were able to kind of feel out if this was going to going to be a good relationship and was going to work for us. So I think, you know, that fear and I think that, you know, that comes up for us. But I think it's a really important one to talk about here in this venue and for us to, you know, just think about, especially as corporate practitioners, when you feel that or that hesitancy with an organization. Um, that's a moment, that's a trust building moment. That's an opportunity to build trust. And that's an opportunity to have a deeper conversation, I think. Um, and we went and did some of those pilots and I'll share a little bit more after, but um, yeah. And just were able to give some really constructive feedback and Story Pirates was very open to implementing and incorporating that feedback too. But Jamie, I'd love to hear from you about some assumptions and things that you were feeling at that time too. Sure, sure. Well, let me take a step back and, um, you know, just say for anyone who's uh, wondering why are we telling you all of this, you know, I think, uh, you know, what we're talking about here today is uh, employee volunteer programs and employee engagement programs. And how do you create a great one and where do great ones come from? And I think what we discovered, and I don't think we discovered it until you had left Salesforce and we reconnected with you and we, we sort of uh, had, you know, it just sort of came to the surface that like actually maybe putting this partnership together was a little bit more complicated than any of us realized at the time in ways that we couldn't fully communicate with each other. You know, I think we've now realized that uh, a, a great employee engagement program and a, an employee volunteer program is a partnership between two unlikely partners, a corporation, which has one set of norms and values and expectations, and often a scrappy nonprofit. Uh, even great ones do not have the resources of Salesforce or even a tiny fraction of, of them. And I think, you know, what we're talking about here is something that there was no word for when we first started collaborating in the early days of the pandemic, but I think there is a word that's sort of, you know, a, a sort of an active uh, part of the zeitgeist in the space right now, uh, which is trust-based philanthropy. And I think we, we what we're talking about a little bit here today is that uh, what is trust-based philanthropy and where does it come into play? You know, I, I think, Amy, you're, something that you touched on that I wanna highlight is how complicated it felt for us in the moment to be honest about our um, challenges or drawbacks as an organization. First, let me just say what we were really confident about. You know, like a lot of your assumptions, Alyssa, I think about our program were well-founded. We were absolutely confident that the program that we had, the volunteer program was an A plus event that would leave employees feeling uh, uplifted, satisfied, like they'd done something important and like they'd connected with their colleagues in a meaningful way, right? It's a team building event. It makes people laugh. They walk away in a great mood. We consistently get rated as one of their favorite volunteer activities. So we're really proud of that. And we were proud of our, you know, sort of like uh, suitcases and, and uh, you know, golf pencil system that we'd created. It was a little scrappy, but it was very effective. You know, we're managing tens of thousands of stories coming from all over the world. And we managed to get every single one of those stories to a different city to in the hands of a volunteer and eventually back to the exact kid who wrote it. And uh, and we never mess it up. Uh, what we were not confident about was doing it all over Zoom. We had no system like we're not a tech company. We're not we don't even have an IT person at all. The closest thing is probably Amy, and that is really saying something, my friends. Terribly. So, you know, I think we we had a moment where uh, 
our entire revenue had just collapsed. You know, if you're if 95 percent of your revenue comes from schools and theaters in March of 2020, those places stopped existing. And we really needed to say yes to what you were asking us to do. And I think you probably did ask some good questions uh, to help us pilot the program safely and make sure to work out any kinks. But, you know, it's like I look back and think to myself, why couldn't we just say to Alyssa back then that week, we feel really confident about a lot of this, but we don't know how to do it digitally. Like we don't know how to get the stories in an organized fashion to everybody. We don't have an IT system that can handle that. Um, you know, you guys are one of the biggest tech companies in the world. Maybe we could find a solution here. That seems really easy right now, but it didn't seem easy at the time. At the time, the only thing that we felt was the power dynamic and that we just needed to say yes and figure out how to make it work. You know, I think what this, the, the idea of trust-based philanthropy, um, you know, as Jamie was saying, a term, if it was being, uh, if it was was being bandied about at all, it was it, it was definitely in siloed conversations. It was a thing that we need. Um, and I, working in the nonprofit space with a lot of different nonprofits, I will also say that we're still just, you know, tip of the iceberg in terms of these conversations. And most of the time when we're seeing these conversations about what does trust-based philanthropy mean? First of all, it's always someone on a dais and a lot of people sitting in a room. Um, there is not a lot of face-to-face -face conversation about it. And almost always we are, those conversations are between a, a philanthropist or a foundation and a nonprofit. And very, very rarely are we seeing those conversations between corporations and nonprofits. And there is, there is a fundamental difference in the way we operate our day-to-day. -day. Nonprofit organizations and the way they get most to their funding, both the way they operate and the way they get most of their funding is always 100% or at least 99% about the mission. And so when they are talking to a government entity, when they are talking to a foundation or an individual who's going to make a gift, most of the time they are promising them nothing in return. In fact, it's actually a tax, tax obligation or complication to offer them something in return. And so the majority of the corporate of the the nonprofits that corporations are talking to have this vocabulary and this understanding of this is where funding comes from. And so the idea that a corporation has any other priorities other than altruism is very, very foreign in the nonprofit space. It is just, it's not something that is expected. It's not something that's understood. And as a reason, and it's also not something that's terribly well communicated because everyone assumes that the other knows this. And so therefore, what I find with most of my clients when I suggest, how about we build a, a volunteer program? There's a fair amount of resentment in that of, well, why am I why am I creating something so that they have employee engagement over there? And the the conversation sort of stops with most nonprofit organizations. Either they don't have the capacity to do it, or they don't understand the point, or they don't want to create something for corporations to 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 feel like they are giving back. And being in the middle, seeing these siloed conversations was the reason why this conversation was so important to us. Why, um, when I had the opportunity to reach out to Alyssa, because we found each other again on, on LinkedIn, um, and we felt like we could, I, I felt like I could ask some questions because what I, what I was experiencing as the Story Love program was growing and I was getting to know more and more corporations, I would get, I believed in what we were offering. I was far more confident because we had built it. Um, I also felt like I knew the questions that I had and had no idea how to get the answers. Things like, why does this corporation work differently than that one? And why? what are your priorities as you're making a decision and how do you figure out what budget it comes from and how do I figure out 
who to talk to at this tech company versus this media company versus this hedge fund? And why is the funding structure so different between all of you? Um, it's it's a it's it's like walking through a maze with no end on our end. And that has been, and that's one of the reasons why if we could break down some of these walls, I think we could make some of this easier. Elsa, you want to talk a little bit about what those different structures look like? Yes, I'd love to. And I think this is a really important piece to touch on because to your point. There are similarities across companies, but there's a lot of differences in these structures too. Um, and the way that money moves in one corporation, it might not move the same in another corporation. Um, and the goals too, but I think there are some kind of overarching goals that a lot of corporate practitioners on the call might agree with. So what I started out by saying, like, you want alignment, ideally, with any sort of philanthropic efforts you put, you're you putting out into the world and whatever priorities you have. So, you know, if this were, you know, something that was supporting physical therapy on horses, like that wouldn't have aligned very well um, with our strategic priorities at Salesforce. Um, so that's, you know, one of the things that is a goal and a criteria checkbox that we're listening for in developing these partnerships, right? Another is what Jamie talked about, like, is it going to feel fun, impactful? Like, there are plenty of efforts and nonprofits out there that are doing great work, but they cannot pull people together in a Zoom room and have fun together. It's just hard to do. Um, and they don't have programming that allows for that. Story Pirates does, which it makes is why it is what makes it so incredible and amazing as a partner. Um, I think another criteria is just the employee engagement piece, period. Like how many can we engage and on what scale? I think, you know, those numbers speak to leadership and per their ears perk up when you're able to say we engaged over 5,000 employees in 10 different countries. Like that's a conversation piece for a corporate practitioner. It's not so much if it's, we engaged one team in New York. Um, so it's, you know, so those are some of the goals that are kind of the checkbox that I have in the back of my mind that I want to bring forward. And then to kind of, you know, move towards like, once you are building that partnership and, Amy, you asked about like those kind of internal navigation points. I think um, we were looking at ways to, if we were going to build a partnership, we wanted it to be sustainable or I did. That was like my personal kind of soapbox that I was on for my team. I was like, if we're going to enter into this, like we want it to be financially sustainable for the nonprofits. We don't want to be kind of a one and done situation. So we need to find the ways to plug them into all the places at our company that will produce some line of funding for them. And again, if you're on the call and you're at a corporation, you do not hold very big purse strings. They're actually quite small as it compares to the rest of your company. Um, so my budget was teeny tiny as it compared to the marketing team or the sales team or our technology team at Salesforce. So I think um, finding those ways and those avenues to get your partner plugged in. And we were able to do that at Salesforce. So we were able to make sure that first of all, this was built into our annual budget so that we had kind of a rotating check that was going to Story Pirates for the work that they were doing with us. We also worked with our recruitment team, so the onboarding team, because you all, Story Pirates started to do all of our onboarding at Salesforce globally. So pulling from their coffers and making sure that they were make, um, supporting Story Pirates. And then this was a team-based thing. So any team could engage with Story Pirates and say, hey, I want to host one over here. Um, and we would say, well, here's the price tag and here's how you, you know, get it um, charge to your cost center. So all of those different funding streams we were trying to bring towards Story Pirates to make sure that the relationship was sustainable. And I'm, I mean, I'm very proud to say, and Amy and Jamie, you can speak to it, but like the partnership continues today. And I think it probably does because we were able to do that. 
Definitely. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that you did that's really helpful that you just mentioned is you sort of diversified the funding within Salesforce itself, uh, which, you know, there, there's a, there's a danger for nonprofits in the space where you have all your eggs in a basket. And I, I know that the budgets for the CSR department within a corporation can be minuscule compared to the larger budget for other departments, but it's an enormous budget for most nonprofits. Mo you know, Amy says the statistic all the time that, uh, you know, I think the typical uh, budget for corporate funding of any kind for nonprofits, like the average is about 3%, right? Of an entire organization's it's budget. Seven. It, uh, overall giving is about 7% um, is corporations. Now that is up 3% over five years in like, according to the, you know, the, the USA giving report, but it is this teeny tiny piece of the pie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, it, it can actually be perilous for nonprofits because, uh, you know, if you're working with, you know, we, I mean, we work with Amazon, Salesforce, NBC, Universal, Comcast. I mean, these are big, big companies. And, you know, if they get a new CSR director or they change strategic directions and all of a sudden they have a totally different kind of philanthropy that they're supporting, that can uh, nearly cripple a nonprofit our size. And one of the things, Alyssa, that you did that is really helpful, like we're still working with, uh, with I think almost all new hires at Salesforce. It's an enormous amount of people. Yeah. Uh, it's you know, it, it we're really honored to be sort of the first touch point in the first week of most employees' experience there, and it helped us uh, be able. You know, Salesforce went through some, um, you know, a, a along with the downturn in the market, uh, you know, toward in the last couple of years, they went through some restructuring and we did feel the impact of that, but it was mitigated um, by being diversified in uh, in different aspects of Salesforce in terms of funding. But I think sort of all of this is, is touching on sort of like this bigger conversation that I think we're having now. And I think we have the credibility to have because we put this partnership together and it, it did thrive. But, you know, now looking back at the partnership, realizing that there are things that we could have talked about and should be talking about going forward in this partnership or in any uh, employee engagement uh, partnership, particularly about how nonprofits and major corporations collaborate with each other, because they're really different types of entities. You know, corporations expect a certain amount of professionalism, like like you mentioned, Alyssa, earlier in the talk, and nonprofits. You know, we certainly know what the expectations are, but it's really complicated for us. Like sometimes a corporation is like, we need an answer on this right now. But like the thing you're asking, the person responsible for that is a part time employee and they work Tuesdays and Thursdays. So those are the only days we can answer that question. And, you know, there's there's just a, a sort of inherent um, structural uh you know, we've used the word power dynamic before. It really is, there's sort of different types of entities with different types of resources that are on some level, I think all, all pretending that they're working on the same exact thing, but they're not approaching it in the same ways. They have different needs. They have different objectives and, and different resources. And, you know, like on the other side of it, for example, this was a big opportunity for us, not a challenge. I think it took us a while. Nonprofits are focused on their mission, right? Like you're focused on how how do I create programming that has the biggest impact on my mission? And for us, you know, sending a note to every single kid of tens of thousands of kids who wrote us a story, that is our mission. That's so important. And it's so incredible that uh, the companies want to help with that. But it took us a while to realize that that's not the most important piece to most companies. That's like a nice cherry on top that we're doing that specific nice thing. The thing that most companies want is for their employees to have a really engaging session that bonds them to each other in their community and to the company. And that's great. Like that's not something we fully understood when we started designing these sessions. We've come to that awareness, like almost through osmosis, like figuring out what's important to our partners. And I think to me, a lot of, of 
what we're hoping for coming out of this session is for there to be more conversations like this between non you know, it, it feels like this type of volunteer based programming is heating up in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, there, there is a need to create programming that meets Gen Z, uh, you know, young employees, millennials, where they are in ways that they find meaningful and makes them want to work for this big company um, more. And these types of conversations, I think, can make those collaborations more fruitful. The, the thing that I recall, the two things that I think are, were the most valuable um, from Alyssa, from a couple other corporations, NBC Universal being being one of them, um, the feedback that we got, the willingness to give us feedback, um, rather than just say, eh, it wasn't perfect, let's move on and find something else. Um, that was incredible. We received simple feedback of, hey, instead of having everyone work on their own pile of stories, can you put them in pairs? And we said, okay and we just quickly figured out you know we googled how do you use a breakout room and then we you know we solved this thing and all of a sudden it became a team building activity it that happened in 40 seconds that we solved that and all of a sudden that opened up a totally different way to promote this uh to promote this program and to make this program meaningful to corporations it didn't really make a difference to us we have enough volunteers we have enough stories so you know they 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 love a few less stories in each but the story love notes were significantly better because they were more thoughtful because they were writing them as a unit so that became more powerful to us so feedback like that the willingness to give us feedback and and our team's willingness which is which is a cultural you know which is uh an organizational culture at story pirates of accepting feedback uh was really important the other thing that um was so meaningful is probably a year later Alyssa. i don't know if you remember how much later it was we had the conversation where you said to us what do you need? I think we were finally at the place where we were confident enough. We were we were not pushing back, but we were sort of saying, okay, we need a little bit more clarity on what it is that you want us to do. We, there, there was a, a call where we were we were sort of talking through, and we, it probably was the first time we were ever expressing any limitation. And um, the Salesforce team said to you, said to us what do you need and at that point schools still weren't open um and we or schools were now different and a lot of the school relationships had shifted and we had the opportunity to say we actually need to reach more schools you've you've created an interesting pendulum swing so can you help us do that and that was that was incredibly meaningful. And what it did internally was it was an epiphany um, for our internal conversations to start saying they didn't they didn't know what we needed. I don't know that they even realized like we're still talking to there, there's there's something that happens that that makes those stories get written, the teaching of creative writing, the inspiring of creative writing. And what that did was it shifted the way we start for, talking to corporations now. If you are interested in a story love event, you got to talk to me. And I am going to tell you what Story Pirates is, whether you want me to or not, right? I am going to tell you that we are inspiring and teaching creative writing, and we are putting a digital um, creative writing curriculum into under-resourced classrooms across the country, and that costs us money. And so when you make a sponsorship towards your volunteer event, that money is going straight towards putting this program into more schools, into translating it into Spanish so that we can reach even more kids in their native language. Um, I was never saying any of that before because I, I didn't, I sort of didn't know that I needed to, which in hindsight feels so silly. Um, but it just wasn't, we, we were just, we, we were saying whatever we needed to, 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 to close the deal. Um, and once we started doing that, we found that the, not always, but most of the time, the relationship with the corporations started to shift. And we would then have the conversations about, wait, but what actually, what exactly do you guys do and what do you need? I think I, I want to add something there and I'm so glad you brought that up and I know that we have about five more minutes in this session so I want to 
kind of maybe add my thought and then we can move to some questions if you're okay with that, Amy and Jamie, because um, we've got a couple, it looks like in the um, Q&A area. But what I want to say about that is, I think we had gotten to a place in our relationship. I agree that we were at a, at a place, a much more trusting place. <clears throat> and when I talked about in the beginning, when I kind of barraged you with like, here's everything we need, can you do it? Um, I mean, part of that questioning was like, have you done things at this size and scale? What technical staffing and budgetary resources do you need? And you were all, you were just kind of like, we can do this. But I think those are questions that should come up again and again. Like, I don't think you just ask it once because the evolution of the relationship, and we're talking about it here, it's, it just, it changes, it evolves, and you get to a more trusting place where you can have those more frank conversations. And to the point about you saying like, hey, we need schools that can help us get the message out there. Um, for the folks on the call, I think most corporations today have some sort of engagement in the school environment, whether it is via STEM, whether it is via some other relationship, they are engaging on the education side. Not all non not all uh, corporations, but I would say a good number of them have relationships in the school systems. So if you're able to bring those relationships and make those introductions to the nonprofit that you're working with, Story Priors being the one that we were doing that with, that just rich, it kind of enriches the, the relationship even more um, and takes it down just like a different pathway. So we're able to open those doorways that we couldn't have otherwise for the nonprofit. So I just wanted to add that and I'm so glad you brought it up. So there are a couple of questions and I saw Jean, you came off of, you came back. Is there something that you I'm wanted to, to share? <laughs> yeah. So um, looking yeah. at the question. Oh, go ahead, Amy. Sorry. No, I was for our questions, okay. please. Um, so looking at the questions in the q and um, I'm going to start with the middle one. So um, Alyssa, how did you and your team continue to engage employees in the same volunteer programming? We often hear an interest in new ideas and struggle to find opportunities to capture many identities, interests, and geographic areas. And I guess, Alyssa, you can start, but then um, Amy and Jamie, if you could chime in as well from what you've seen with other clients. Yeah, and I think... Um... Amy and Jamie can kind of speak to how the sessions evolved and the our offerings evolved too. It wasn't always kind of the same thing that we were putting out there. So I think that kept employees interested. I just think um, in addition to that, and this is um, something that we were trying really hard to do at Salesforce. And we had some gamification like in our technology in the background that was running, that was helping to enable these behaviors. But all that to say, we wanted our employees to go deeply with nonprofits rather than spread themselves out and kind of do the like throw spaghetti on the wall, engage with 10 different nonprofits over the course of the year. Like we were encouraging the behavior to go more deeply with the nonprofits that we were working with. So we wanted teams to develop a partnership, not just do one session with Story Pirates, but like make it this, their relationship that they were going to invest in over the coming year. And the conversations that I had with Story Pirates, then Story Pirates can have those with other teams because they're becoming more of, that becomes more of a relationship there. So I know that, you know, Story Pirates did a few different things and they continue to kind of try different things and make, you know, keep things fresh. Um, but at the heart of it, it's these, I mean, I probably did 10 Story Pirate sessions and I will tell you, um, <laughs> None. It, it never got boring. I'll just say that much. So this particular engagement is very different from others. Maybe planting trees very feels very rote. Like, but these the the opportunity for fun and engagement and just to hear these stories it never got old for me. But I don't know, Jamie or Amy, if you have anything to add to that. Uh, I would. Yeah. I mean, I think on some level. Uh, story parts doesn't get old because the stories themselves are genuinely entertaining and they're so funny and weird and crazy. They they make for really organic um, engagement. Um, but I, you know, we we have created different variations of story love. But I think we've had a we feel the pressure from companies as well that they're always looking for something new. And we've racked our brains like, do we have a totally different opportunity to shake things up? And we do not. 
Uh, and we're not going to create an inorganic one and, unless we come up with something honestly, do you know? Like, I think one of the reasons it works and what I'd be looking for if I were a company is a volunteer program that's not tacked on to try to get corporate dollars, something that's genuinely uh, integral to the company, like a real need that is best served by using volunteers. And, you know, story love just sort of fits. But I didn't come on to uh, promote this, but I'll just mention that we, we do have uh, some new non-volunteer uh, employee engagement workshops that we're bringing to companies. We have one uh, at SNAP that we're doing next month. And our, we think we have a lot to bring to the table, particularly for companies that are grappling with employees coming back to the office and maybe wishing that they were still at home and making the environment at work more collaborative, engaging, fun, playful, uh, using some of the storytelling techniques that we've uh, pioneered. Uh, another yeah. example is our our uh, some some media companies, some from our media partners. One. Um, one works really hard to pair us with other nonprofits um, mm. and then bring employee mentors into that. So if you're trying to figure out why Jamie and I look familiar, apparently we are in a PSA that runs on all um, NBC Universal streaming properties that my mother keeps telling me keeps airing. So um <laughs> And that was all through, that was all because of our volunteer, that started with our volunteer engagement. Uh, it started with our partnership with that corporation. Um, and they paired us with a with a, a group that that in, um, mentors teenagers to put together videos and then use their own incredible, you know, uh, television producers to act as mentors for that. Um, so that that was an idea they had but then we got to be creative with them so if there's a stagnancy look at what you have to offer i mean certainly working with a tech company to build a platform that would have made sense for us could have been a really valuable way to do that too so what sort of in kind support could someone by nature of what they already do um you know some some pro bono work that i think that that's that's another way to go I love that you brought that up as an option. Yes. Pro bono projects, um, leveraging your employee skills. I think that's a, a great plug yeah. for, for think, companies. I think that's one thing that we've learned from talking to members um, is that the the variety of different opportunities is what's driving volunteerism in corporate America or corporate globally. Um, there's you know, how do you piece together lots of different opportunities um, to satisfy different kinds of preferences and interests? Um, and pro bono is a big piece of that. So um, with that, I would like to um, thank our speakers today um, for being involved and sharing their wisdom and their experience in this wonderful story. Um, I also would like to thank all the participants who joined today's session. And um, we very much appreciate your time um, and hope you found it valuable. Um, before you log off, we very much would like your feedback um, on the screen is a QR code that takes you to a very short survey. And the link to the survey is also in the chat. So please um, click on that before you log off um, and share your thoughts. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, we are recording the session. We will send out the recording um, along with information about Story Pirates um, after the session. Um, and so with that, um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and a good rest of the week. I hope you will be able to join us also for some of the other CSR Marketplace virtual sessions um, tomorrow and on Thursday. Um, so with that, thanks everyone. Thanks, Jean. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody.